Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, well, good morning to everybody. I think it's, uh, it's super exciting to uh, address a whole uh, audience of uh, transformation ninjas. Um, I think uh, the basic bottom line of today's talk is you have a lot of work to do, uh, which is probably a good thing, but not necessarily a good thing for the rest of us. I'm not sure. But <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get this morning started before we dig into all the sort of deep technical details with a little bit of a um, of an icebreaker, a um, little culture quiz. Any of you recognize this painting? The, the, who, who painted this? Rembrandt? Rembrandt? How many people think it's Rembrandt? Yeah? Anybody think it's somebody else? Yeah? Uh, this was actually painted uh, by an algorithm. Uh, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, fascinating. Fascinating project, fascinating project. It was uh, done by a uh, collaboration of uh, people over at the, in Holland and uh, Rembrandt's Museum with, uh, with uh, some folks from the technology sector, uh, primarily a lot of Microsoft people, where they uh, scanned all of Rembrandt's paintings, uh, 3D scans of every single one of them, and then they pulled together uh, uh, sort of all the data, analyzed it with a bunch of different algorithms, figure out the patterns, understood the painting style, and then re-implemented this uh, through 3D printing. So the printing is actually 3D printed on canvas, right? With, uh, with a bunch of, uh, with a bunch of uh, um, work sort of behind it. Uh, but uh, there's no such Rembrandt painting. Uh, this is basically what happens when you, you know, sort of give the algorithm, say, a, 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 sort of a challenge, say, you know, paint a, you know, a person uh, with a hat uh, staring over to the sides in the Rembrandt style. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, Friend, yeah? 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 Any, any, anyone think it's cool? Yeah? Some people think it's cool. Some people think it's cool. Who think it's cool? Who think it's, who think it's disturbing? Who think it's both? It's both, yeah? I mean, it's just kind of, this, this is kind of where we are right now, right? This, this is, to me, I find this project fascinating because it's both incredibly exciting, it's incredibly interesting, and what the technology can do is mind-blowing. At the same time, it's also frightening because this is hitting uh, at the core of some very basic things in human nature, right? When you can go out there and replicate the Rembrandt uh, style in such incredible detail and, and power. Uh, I mean, it's got all kinds of different applications. I mean, if you want to go have your own personal Rembrandt painting at home, you can now do that, and you can just 3D print it and uh, get a real one instead of a fake one. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's probably a good application of this. But there's something really that touches the humanity of this through the bone, and this is one of the things that, to me, is fundamentally a really interesting icon what we're living through right now. Uh, the reactions to this is really interesting, you know, sort of uh, from the critics' perspective. Some, some of them are, as, as, as a view, it's like it's fascinating, it's surprisingly good, it's surprisingly representative. But my favorite reaction is from this guy, uh, Jonathan Jones, who is sort of one of the world's uh, most renowned uh, Rembrandt critics, uh, who is absolutely outraged. Uh, you know, the digital Rembrandt, a new way to mock art made by fools. And then he goes on to talk about how this is like you know the worst thing that happened to humanity basically over the last uh, few uh, few centuries, and you know how how dare they? Uh, and then and then he goes actually into a pretty interesting uh, rendition of how this is really not like a Rembrandt at all because it's like fundamentally they didn't catch the the uh, sort of the gestalt if you like of the old Rembrandt, but uh, it's uh, it's quite interesting. And I think you know it, again this is a signal that we're living through a pretty interesting moment, I think, in the history of our civilization, fundamentally, where uh, machines are starting to get interestingly good at things, and it's changing a lot of stuff. Um, the, uh, in fact, uh, I think this, this month, uh, the first uh, actual um, AI uh, in, entirely sort of driven piece of work is, is being auctioned off at uh, Christie's. Uh, uh, and we'll see how much it goes for. Uh, it would be interesting to kind of see. And it's, it's, it's an interesting piece of art. Uh, it's worth uh, taking a peek at. Uh, so what's happening? Uh, this took a long time. Uh, I've been in HPS for 30 years, which is a long time. Uh, I started off as 
pretty much one of the first, if not the first real technology person uh, at the Harvard Business School. I uh, spent a lot of time trying to convince some people that technology companies someday might be worth as much as General Motors and essentially being laughed at. Uh, and uh, essentially, you know, over the last few years, we've had all these waves of investment in technology that we have uh, consistently criticized and laughed at and you know, the, how long it takes to implement SAP and all that kind of good stuff. But one of the things that's really fascinating about what's happened so far is that all of a sudden, uh, we have a real infrastructure that is capturing sort of digital signals and transmitting them across our entire economy. Uh, and it's really hit critical mass. All of a sudden, after you know, a couple of trillions of dollars worth of investments, right, we really have a fabric that's changing the structure of our economy. It's changing the structure of our society in different ways. Uh, it's kind of another interesting picture. Uh, this one was uh, uh, scanned in 1957. And it's actually the first uh, digitally uh, scanned photograph. right? And uh, one of the things to start from is that when a signal is digitized, Something really unique happens uh, to it because uh, analog sort of, uh, unlike our traditional sort of analog things, or physical objects or analog signals, there's some properties of digital signals that really change everything. Because once you digitize something like this, what you can do is you can replicate it. Uh, and you can replicate it essentially at zero cost, and you can replicate it perfectly, right? So you can have a website in Boston, and they have exactly the same web page rendered in Bangalore, and it looks exactly the same, and it's an exact replica one with the other. Uh, it's, a, it's a perfect replication technology, uh, which is kind of the only one. It is a zero marginal cost or near zero marginal cost technology. And those things change everything, right? Because all of a sudden, we go from a position where uh, you know, everything has to be in some ways uniquely crafted, manufactured, and you uh, service uh, 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 to, to something that can be replicated and connected and um, uh, transmitted into networks that go around the world and, and, uh, and provide all kinds of new opportunities for business, uh, for economics, and for, you know, social interaction uh, and political interaction increasingly as we're seeing as well. The other thing that's interesting that happens is that once you digitize the picture, uh, you can actually improve it, uh, which is a really strange thing. Uh, when we think about sort of all of a sudden you stick it through a sort of, you know, basically a neural net machine learning algorithm, it's well trained, you can take the picture and give it more life. Uh, you can actually improve things uh, with digital technology, which is an unusual thing, right? Uh, when we all think about organizational learning, uh, learning organizations, right? We don't usually think of them as a bunch of algorithms, right? But when you shop on Amazon, the Amazon algorithms that's out there setting price and doing various things learns constantly, serves up new pictures, new figures in real time. Uh, in some ways, it's a new kind of neural learning organization, right? So digital technology can connect things at zero marginal cost, can transmit things essentially free, free of cost, can improve over time. And as a result of this, we have increasingly Right? A society that is, has connections everywhere, that has things that are improving on a dimension and on a scale that we can't necessarily observe. Right? There's all this stuff going on behind the surface that we can't really see that is changing the way that our society and our economy works in a profound way. Um, the, the economy, and this is, we'll unpack this, um, is gradually evolving into this massive network of things. Where you know traditionally we've had these concepts that have enabled all of us to drive uh, strategies and implementations. This thing's called industries, right? Uh, and the you know the consulting profession is based on industry analysis, right? Michael Porter, Five Forces, all that kind of great stuff. When the economy begins to look more and more like a network, right? where the competition can come at you from any kind of direction from before. Very different looking organizations competing for the same user, for the same customer, for the same value. You have a fundamentally different uh, kind of setting and a fundamentally different kind of uh, challenge. Um, and uh, it has broad-based uh, implications that cut across a lot of different levels of management, implications for leadership, 
implications uh, as we starting to understand more and more uh, for you know pol political and social systems as well. Um, one of the one of my favorite uh, sort of data points to look at. Uh, it's a little bit of a hack, but if you look at uh, the market capitalization of firms on a per employee basis, right? And you compare uh, sort of a digital platform firm uh, or hub company like Facebook or Google or Microsoft uh, to a traditional firm, uh, something really strange is going on in the sense you have uh, a value, a capitalization per employee that is an order of magnitude higher, even than a Goldman Sachs, right? Compared to Walmart, we're many orders of magnitude away. But even Goldman Sachs, someone that you know, traditionally we've thought of as, wow, this is like, crazy company, you know, lots of value per employee, sort of lots of intellectual property and in how they do things, good, bad, ugly, whatever you like. But uh, compared to that, uh, you know, what, what Facebook is worth, uh, what Google is worth on a per person basis is an order of magnitude off. Whenever you have an order of magnitude change, right, it kind of means that something special is going on. This is not just a, a different business model. This is not just that it's sort of a disruption or a, a new model applied to an old business or a, this is what we're talking about here is a fundamentally different type of firm, a fundamentally different type of organization, right? And it's the first time. So the, our, our, uh, our history goes back a long time, right? So my unit, uh, technology and operations management, um, started off uh, many years ago as a, you know, studying manufacturing. Uh, we literally used to roll milling machines in the classroom back in the 1950s, teach our MBAs how to use them. Uh, it's a little different these days, right? Uh, but uh, it's, it's still, I mean, we've been going back a long time in thinking about sort of how companies work. And the operations of a company or the operating model of a company goes back a long way. Uh, operating models traditionally are designed to essentially do three things. Uh, the first thing is they drive scale, right? You want to make a lot of stuff or you want to do big things, right? So if you're Goldman Sachs, you want to drive scale because you do big deals. If you're Ford, you drive scale because you want to make a lot of cars. And so there's a lot of MBAs, a lot of uh, engineers, process engineers that are out there, uh, have been out there for centuries, uh, essentially since the late 1800s in many ways, uh, figuring out how to drive scale. The second thing is scope, right? Uh, like the old Sears catalog was the big, huge innovation in a business that uh, could uh, drive significant scope and give variety to a lot of people. If you're out there uh, in the Midwest uh, back 100 years ago and you didn't have access to all these cool products and things, at least you had the Sears catalog and you can go out there and order stuff. Uh, and uh, that's actually a picture uh, of the old uh, Sears um, kind of control room, if you like. Uh, that was done, you know, so we had little messages kind of flying around in these little shoots. Uh, it feels like a kind of a little bit of a Charlie Chaplin movie, but uh, it actually worked very efficiently, and you could drive a lot of scope and a lot of variety. Uh, the third thing uh, is learning, right? We all talk about learning organizations, and obviously it's a huge field, right? One of the icons there may be Toyota with the Toyota production system, continuous improvement, uh, you know, all this wonderful stuff that that we can do, uh, generation of intellectual property, R&D, uh, all kinds of great things. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's really interesting about our um, approach to this, and in fact, most of us have really been working on these things, so it's like getting organizations bet to be better, probably mostly on the right-hand side, right? A lot of us trying to figure out how to transform, how to innovate, how to make things better, how to change things. But, uh, you know, a lot of us trying to figure out how to make this model work more smoothly, right? And traditionally, uh, the value that's delivered by an organization uh, reaches diminishing returns, right? As the organization gets larger, it becomes harder and harder and more and more unwieldy to actually uh, work with, right? So you have, you can play tricks, you can do all kinds of reorganizations, you can put in an SBU structure, you can try to cut it down into more smaller units, right? But at the end of the day, there is a limit to how large these organizations get. I don't know how many of you are out there are sort of you know, working to help small teams become more efficient, break things up into smaller units, figure out how to spin things off. 
separate innovation to autonomous teams, uh, you know, uh, over here, all the kind of great stuff, right? All these things are essentially, you know, at a high level, uh, methods to get around this fundamental problem. The interesting thing, though, is this problem uh, is really a function of, in many ways, a human-centered organization, right? So what you have is you have a bunch of different people internal to a single organization. It can be subdivided into a bunch of components, right? That organization is a function of all the information that you shift around. You can be better at, at managing that information. You can put some local IT systems, right, which uh, often can help uh, on this problem. You can actually go out there and do you know, virtual teams. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. But you still kind of have this bottleneck, this, uh, this limit uh, on size. This is really driven by operational complexity, uh, all kinds of different costs, and, and you know, organizational inertia, what makes it hard to innovate. Uh, today, it's a bit of a different deal, right? We have these things called uh, platforms or digital platforms, digital platform firms. Digital platform firms like Facebook, Google, Alibaba, Ant Financial. Uh, how many of you have heard of Ant Financial, by the way? A few. OK, good. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit. Um, uh, really interesting kinds of uh, organizations uh, where um, uh, what, what creates value in a platform, by the way? What, what's the value creation model for a digital platform class? Traffic, so you build, you build engagement down here, right, on the consumer side, and what do you do with that traffic? How do you monetize it? Advertising, advertising. so you got the advertisers over here, so you have different sides, right? Platforms are handling these multi-sided things, right, that uh, deliver value by orchestrating different sides of a single market, creating synergies among those sides. Those synergies are things that we call network effects, right? And so the more we have, we can figure out how to orchestrate different synergies between the different sides of the platform, the more value we can, we can deliver to and capture from the consumers, right? Platform is, is really kind of an interesting idea, and it's directly, fundamentally, out of the connectivity, right, of digital networks, right? So uh, I do a bunch of works, so I roll up a bunch of consumers, I get really a lot of engagement. Uh, you know, Facebook spends uh, six, seven years uh, just driving engagement in its own consumer base, right? And then monetizes this by plugging it into all kinds of different opportunities, right? So you can kind of see these platforms, in many ways, are becoming the new hubs, right, of our economy. Because part of what happens is a function of this multi-sidedness is that, you know, the consumer market here is linked up to a whole bunch of different players, right? iPhone maybe is a classic example. I mean, think about how many different industries connect through the iPhone that's currently in your pocket, right? It's like every single sector out there is in there, right? So what, which industry is the iPhone really in, right? Is it in a smartphone industry, or is it in some other strange, crazy thing which is connected to everything? And I think there's more to the latter than the former. Um, the second thing that happens with platforms is that they can accumulate a lot of data. You know, part of it is you drive that engagement, right? You suck in a lot of characteristics of uh, a lot of uh, elements of what the consumers uh, are doing. You get data. The more data you have, the better the algorithms get. The better the algorithms get, the more cool things you can do with the consumers. The more usage you get, the more data you get, and so on. So there's another cycle, right? That, that, that improves uh, on, the, on the existing platform cycle. Because platforms, the, the network effect model looks like this, right? So a platform that has no users, right? How much does Facebook work with no users? Zero, right? Yeah? Right, everybody gets that? Yeah? I mean, the, so basically, one of the reasons why is Facebook worth so much money? Because we're all doing the work, right? I mean, that's ultimately the reason, right? Because it's, it's really a business model that is, a platform is built on orchestrating what somebody else does, <laughs> essentially. Right? That's how the business model works. And no wonder it's efficient, right? They're not really, and no wonder that, that value is so skyrockets, right, as the number of people inside the company, because the real employees are all of us, right? right? Uh, we just, they just don't pay us. Uh, they should. Uh, uh, so with a network effects uh, business, you have a fundamentally different kind of curve where all of a sudden there's zero value for a long time until you have a lot of users, right? 
Uh, and then as you get more and more users, the value begins to increase and it gets serious. And then as, as you reach critical mass, that value that you get can, uh, can uh, uh, challenge uh, traditional businesses. Machine learning takes these curves, analytics takes these curves and makes them sharper, okay? So essentially there's a lot of debate right now. You have Hal Varian out there at Google saying, oh, learning effects are not uh, network effects. You know, don't mess, mess things up. But the reality is that there's multiple ways in which companies that occupy digital hubs improve with scale, right? One way is just by having more users, the more users get more partners, more partners you get more users and so on. That's one way, it's the network effects. The other way is with, with more data, right? So the more data you get, uh, classification of objects gets better, currency diagnosis gets better, personality prediction, gets better, you can, just, you can uh, fire up better ads, you can price better, you can do lots of different things, right? So basically the model here is that as you get network effects, the impact of learning sharpens the curve, right? And you have something that it's even more threatening to a traditional business. Uh, the third piece has to do with scope. Um, uh, so uh, uh, who of you actually knew about Ant Financial? Yeah, what, what do they do? Yeah, it's a, it's, essentially it's a financial platform, right? And it's a fascinating company. It's, uh, it started off uh, as a spin out from Alibaba. Uh, in the early days of Alibaba, um, Alibaba um, had a hard time completing transactions in, uh, uh, in China, also because, because there was not a lot of trust between the individual players. It's kind of a peer-to-peer e-commerce thing. And so it's like, well, I don't really trust, uh, you know, who, whatever for this thing. So they decided to build essentially a trust system in Alipay. Alipay is something that actually puts the essential transaction in escrow until it's cleared on both sides. So it's a payment system that actually engenders trust in between different organizations. So Alipay was instrumental in getting Alibaba to scale to the hundreds of millions of users that they have today. What they did then is like, well, Alipay should really be a separate company for a bunch of different reasons, uh, regulation in China, et cetera, and so they spun it out. And all of a sudden, Alipay, you know, what can you do with all the payments that you get in, Ali, in, Ali, in Alipay? What do the payments give you? Cash? What else? Data, right? Cash and data, right? That's interesting from a business perspective, right? Right? And so you get there, and from, uh, from the cash and data that you get out of Valley Pay, uh, you build China's biggest credit system. Um, so now credit rating in China is driven by uh, essentially and financial in large part. Uh, they're the largest organization doing this. All the data from Alipay goes into that, which is, a, you know, it's, if you think about it, it's a ginormous conflict of interest, right? Because you go out there and say, well, you know, if your credit rating is not that great, just buy some more stuff on Alibaba, I'm sure it'll go up, right? So. It's kind of crazy. Uh, then, you know, we got all this money, we got to figure out something to do with it. So you got Yuebao, which is like now it's the world's largest money market fund, right? Uh, lar largest asset base. Uh, my bank, it's small business loans, uh, and credit pay is, a, is essentially a credit system, and fortune is private wealth, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is on track to becoming the largest financial institution in the world. Uh, if it doesn't, first collapse in a big, huge hole with, uh, with all the risks that it's, uh, that it's taking on. But uh, in financial, to me, is probably the most interesting organization that I've seen in the last few years. Um, it, is, it has now something like 600, 650 million customers, right? So if you think about it, uh, how many customers does the Bank of America have? Anybody know? Largest bank in the US? Uh, actually, it's not Bank of America, it's, it's Chase, but um, about 100 million, right? So about 100, 120, right? That's a huge bank. It took 100 years to do that, right? All of a sudden, this thing was started in 2014, okay? <laughs> this is insane. I mean, you think about the scalability of this model. Like, what's the constraint on this, right? What's the constraint? What could possibly go wrong? Trust? What could happen here? Got a couple hundred billion dollars of, uh, 
money market funds. They, with, uh, by the way, for a while, they were, they were uh, uh, offering incredible uh, interest rates uh, on their money markets. Anyway, the, the, one of the things that's interesting about AI Financial is, is uh, what do you think their risk profile looks like, right? Their risk profile, right? So on the one hand, unbelievable business. Uh, you know, huge growth, uh, all kinds of exciting uh, new business models and interesting stuff. On the other hand, we're, this, is a, you know, this is a crisis in a box, right? Because if this thing blows up, uh, the you know, 400, 500 million people in China get their savings uh, sort of out the window. Uh, it's the world financial crisis. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, obviously, it's growing way beyond China with uh, Alipay and so on. It, they were going to buy MoneyGram in the US. Uh, it was blocked by the Trump administration, which is kind of an interesting little step. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, in a microcosm, you see sort of the advantage of the model, right? This incredible scalability, this incredible uh, scope uh, that they can get in almost instantly, right? By just opening up their interfaces to a bunch of different complementary products. And on the learning side, you know, if you look at their ant, uh, their ant. Uh, uh, the MyBank uh, product, which is business loans, they can approve a business loan in one minute, right? Uh, you go out there, it takes three minutes to do the application, it takes one minute to process it, you get your approval back uh, right away, and you know, it's sort of a function of, of uh, you know, a massive amount of investment in machine learning algorithms in the background, because they already have all your data anyway, right? So they've, they know all about you, they figure all this stuff out. In one minute, you got your business loan, or you don't. Uh, to borrow an umbrella in China these days, uh, actually, the, their uh, the Jima credit is really useful. So it's kind of like, you know, without this bloody digital platform, you can't even borrow the, uh, an umbrella when it's raining. Um, uh, so what's happening to the traditional operating model drivers? Right? What's happening to these things? Boom, right? It's all, it's all going away. Uh, and uh, you know, sort of, you got scale. Uh, you got cloud, cloud computing scale, massive amounts of uh, processing power there, uh, zero marginal costs, network effects, scope, the kind of uh, you know scope advantage of an ant financial that you could go from industry to industry with very little cost going going past, and um, uh, essentially cost, constant innovation and. and uh, Lots of AI ML driven improvement. This is where I think we're seeing uh, this one uh, is playing out right now. This one's playing out right now, uh, accelerating. And the learning piece, I think we're just starting up on. Uh, this is like we'll see over the next 10 years getting further and further uh, down the line. So, uh, what happened to Nokia? Anybody had a Nokia phone at some point? Yeah? How many of you have still have a Nokia phone? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. There we go. So uh, what happened? Why is Nokia gone? Apple. What did Apple do? Smartphone. What's a smartphone? Platform. Right? What's a platform? Network. Network effects. Right? Boom. Right? That's kind of, in a way, what happened. Uh, this is something that we could, could talk for hours about. It's really a fascinating example. It is sort of the example of the last 10 years that kind of, in a, in a nutshell, captures a lot of dynamics of the collision between a dig digital platform business and more traditional product business. Right? Nokia was a fantastic product company, and in fact, uh, also had elements of a technology platform within it. It had uh, Symbian, uh, it worked with all kinds of different technologies. It invented most of the things that are in the iPhone. The only true invention in the original iPhone was the multi-touch. So the fact that you can use two fingers and you know, spread things around. Everything else was essentially a Nokia invention. Uh, touch screen, they were the first phone with touch screen. Uh, they were the first phone with the browser. They were the second phone with a camera. They, were, they had an app store two years before the iPhone had an app store. Uh, so, Total invention, right? But built as a product company, right? The Apple platform business, you know, it's out there. We have a huge ecosystem of providers, uh, lots of applications, everything from financial services to exercise and fitness, uh, connecting everybody through this one device. Nokia could not do it 
uh, because they were designed like a product business. Multi, so lots of individual teams, everyone had both hardware and software capabilities. Uh, go out there and make the perfect product for your niche, whether it's uh, you know, sort of the market in India, whether it's the market in the US, completely different phones, completely different functionality. Lots of freedom to the individual teams, right? As opposed to, you know, how many iPhones did Apple introduce? Like one, right? After all this time, now they have essentially a couple of different models. There's a large and a small, they're kind of similar, and then there's one that's a different screen now. And there's another one that's essentially sort of similar, but a little bit lower functionality. After all these years, you know, a month ago, they finally uh, opened up their product line a little bit. But basically, the iPhone is a one product business. Right? It's a one product business worth a trillion dollars. Right? That's, the, that's the platform right there. Right? And I'll show you some, some data on this in a little bit. Do you see this kind of effect, this collision effect, going on anywhere else? Any other environments that you can think of? Cars? cars? How is it happening in cars? A bunch of product companies, all of a sudden the car is becoming an open system. Google is coming in, Waymo, right? Different business model. Uh, interesting economics, if you actually work out the economics on the car industry going forward, the amount of money you can make on a service-based model and, or on an advertising-based model. You can literally give away the car for free and make money on the ads that you can display on the inside on your big Google screens, right? Uh, uh, it's true. Uh, but lots of different environments. Uh, so Marriott Airbnb is one of my favorite ones. Uh, you know, you got New York Times versus Facebook, which is not quite a clean example. You got you know Viacom and the media companies versus Netflix and Amazon Video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? This phenomenal collision is restructuring our economy and changing the nature of competition. And, and all it is, uh, is fundamentally a different model of the firm. It's not a classic disruptive effect because in disruption, what you have is you have you know, so you have two firms. One of them has an innovative way of designing its own business model, usually coming out from the bottom, you know. And uh, my good friend Clay uh, totally exposed this, but in, on this one, uh, we're doing some work together right now, so we're really begin to define sort of the next generation of, of, uh, of disruption, if you like, uh, which is really this collision between two fundamentally different types of firms. It's two different kinds of entities. Airbnb and Marriott is one of my favorite examples. Um, Merit, very successful company, 100 years old, uh, uh, grew through acquisition. Last one with uh, Starwood, now the largest, essentially, hotel company in the world. Um, one and a half million rooms offered per day. Uh, do any of you know how many are offered on Airbnb on a daily basis? Yeah, it's four and a half million. Four and a half million. Like, Airbnb is sort of the end financial of the hotel industry, right? So out there, with this massive capacity, it's just kind of grew out of nowhere. And if you think about what it takes to build a Marriott, right, your attention to service, so you're you know, grooming you know, people in individual hotels, thinking about the unique Starwood experience, the loyalty programs, the you know, Ritz Carltons of the world. I mean, it's just incredible. And then you come out of left field, which is essentially you know, a bunch of kids growing up, Y Combinator, Accelerator, boom, here it goes. And then you know, six, seven years later, you got something that's competitive to the largest hotel farm in the world. So it's back to that curve. It's either nothing or it's a lot, right? So um, a digital platform business in the beginning looks like nothing, and then as it grows up, it gets pretty competitive pretty fast. So this is a little bit of a sort of my illustrative uh, goofy heat map uh, looking across industries, right? Is if you, so is, this is kind of happening in a lot of different places, right? Uh, be interesting to see what's happening to the, you know, where, the, you, where you put the consulting business. Uh, I was thinking about it this morning. I should have uh, had a guess in there. But a couple of things. I mean, on the, on the one axis, you can map out digital maturity. You know, so how far along is the operating model typically in this industry? And obviously, huge approximation. I mean, uh, these industries are enormous, and they kind of spread uh, across this map, but just sort of as an intuition. And secondly, how, you know, how important are these network and learning effects that we've been talking about in a specific industrial environment? Uh, and so, you know, you got industries, like in some ways the mining industry, it's still fairly safe. Well, it's far, actually, there's probably more technology in here than I'm acknowledging it. Uh, but not huge network effects in mining. You don't, you don't need this huge user base and so on. Um, 
Uh, industrial products tend to be relatively uh, uh, on the left-hand side of the two by two because it's really hard to aggregate data across lots of different industrial verticals. Right? On the other hand, the consumer side of the economy is being transformed at a rate that is uh, virtually disturbing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, industries that have already seen extensive transformation, cloud computing, and so on. Retail is in the middle of all kinds of stuff right now, uh, all kinds of excitement. Uh, and Walmart is doing some interesting things uh, going across it. Uh, you know, media is in the middle of it, uh, airlines, uh, hotel industries, uh, automotive, uh, you know, uh, is right in there. Uh, where would you put consulting? Where would you put consulting? What's the level of digital maturity of uh, the consulting firm? <laughs> yeah, we kind of like somewhere on mining maybe, you know? Uh, maybe a little better than uranium mining, you know? It's like... Uh, uh, but, you know, there's, it's interesting, right? I, I think, you know, it's one of those last bastions of the good old uh, service-based operating model, and we'll see how far that goes. I mean, there's, um, there are all kinds of interesting opportunities for network effects, crowdsourcing, and uh, we're all kind of working with that. I would, I would sort of put, put us down here, maybe a little bit above healthcare. Uh, yeah. But I think the next few years are going to be interesting, right? And we see all companies, you know, McKinsey and everybody else, just investing like crazy and sort of building out digital platforms and figuring out how to play that game. And, and uh, it's, it's quite, I should put that, I should add that. <laughs> What's that? Oh, we're down here. <laughs> actually, no, we're down, we're down here, actually, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're exactly, Harvard Business School is right there. Uh, we have, we are Nokia. We are so Nokia, in fact. We are so Nokia. We are so, like, we have all these different product businesses. They're called MBA program, alumni relations, uh, publishing completely siloed, our data is splintered across a million different things, and it's driving me completely nuts because I'm living this every day, and I sit down with my wonderful dean, who I love dearly, and it's like, that all makes sense, Marco, but I can't fix it, so, you know, like, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm like, what are we doing? You know, asking, you know, teaching people how to fix that if we can fix our own mess, but, um, yeah, I should definitely put that there, that would be honest. Uh, anyway, so, here we go. So, a uh, little bit, um, so let's, let's, uh, Kick this up a notch, right? A lot of transformation in the, um, uh, at the firm level, right? What's happening more broadly? There's all, all sorts of interesting, exciting, and somewhat depressing things uh, that we can talk about. Uh, let's at least scratch the surface a little bit. Some new rules. Uh, world is looking a little bit more like this. Those are all clones. Anyway, uh, so first. <laughs> First, first rule is, I mean, yeah, digital is everywhere, and every, it's becoming a stereotype. But th there's actually a reason for this, right? It's, this is, it's really a combination of three things uh, that are essentially, to some extent, a combination of math and, and uh, a little bit of technology uh, evolution stuff. First one is you can think about Moore's Law as driving all of this. Moore's Law, people are talking about is saturating, maybe not moving as fast. But at the bottom line, all that needs to happen to change things, right, is that digital technology improves faster than humans do, right? We don't improve very quickly. Uh, you can all come to Harvard Business School for a refresher course. Great improvement level, you can go to it. A little touch, right? Uh, but we basically stay the same uh, during our lifetimes, uh, whereas digital technology sort of doubles, if not every two years, then uh, in performance pretty quickly, right? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we're getting through this. So let, let, me, let me unpack that a little bit, but huge responsibility, I think, that we all have in this. But uh, this is kind of what we're, in some ways, what we're fighting against, in some ways, what's also helping us, right? So you have this relentless progress that's just going on. It's just this machine that keeps on getting better, right? Uh, you got this machine connects into networks, and the networks keep getting more valuable, right? Uh, it's Metcalf's law, it's math. You build connections if you assume that a connection has some value. Value goes up, it goes up uh, geometrically, uh, lots of interesting stuff here. And the third piece is uh, actually this guy, uh, Laszlo Barbashi, who's a mathematician, uh, is like in Northeastern now, but back in the 90s, he wrote this seminal paper on the internet and showed how the internet itself uh, was scaling as a scale free network. And as part of this, there is this essentially law of preferential attachment, uh, which basically means that if you're important, if you're connected, over time, you're likely to get more connected, right? 
So when you're in the middle of a network, and many networks work this way. If you have put a little bit of evolutionary theory in, in, in the, the way you think about networks, the networks will evolve, and as they evolve, they develop hubs. You can see as airline hubs, you can see as supply chain hubs. It's more efficient to go out through a hub-like structure in a network, and economic transactions are the same way. The internet is a scale-free network, meaning that we don't have individual segments that can be identified at the highest level, which means that industries are essentially going away. Um, but this one says that there is concentration intrinsically that is happening across the networks that we see. And this is kind of, in some ways, on a mathematical level, it's sort of what explains back, you know, sort of why is it that we have these superstar firms and uh, just the, it's, it's math, <laughs> right? Someone is likely to get more connected than somebody else, and once they get more connected, then the cycle begins, right? Second piece is, is turbulence, and I think that there is, you know, whenever you have a system where you have this constant force of things changing, right, which is you have this engine of improvement, which is digital technology that keeps on going, uh, the rest of us are out there trying to figure out how all the changes go on. And so, you know, you have a lot of changes at the business level, a retail apocalypse and what have you, you have a lot of changes, uh, you know, kinds of speculation, you know, the price of Ethereum, new technologies that we're trying to figure out what to do with and value that all coming out of essentially this digital machine. Uh, and then, you know, overall sort of policy and, and uh, political uncertainty that seems to be also growing over time. Uh, now, you probably think I'm crazy, but I think all these things are actually connected. And I think that at the end of the day, if you go back to some of the reasons why right now we've seen so much different political uncertainty around the world, it's related to the same fundamental engine uh, that's driving all of this. The third uh, rule, if you like, it's what I would call universality. It's an ugly word, but basically what it says is that the kinds of, so the strategies that we see in the hotel industry, like can you imagine 10 years ago, right, talking to the CEO of Marriott about APIs, application program interfaces, right, or machine learning or analytics or data science or any of this stuff 20 years ago. It's impossible, right, because like you talk about, you know, well, how do you do great service in a fantastic hotel, right? That's what differentiates the business. Now what's differentiating business across many, many industries, traditional industries, is a set of universal capabilities around analytics, around machine learning, uh, or ability to understand data by customers and, and tailor your experience to that. Uh, the strategic challenges are also becoming relatively similar. There's nuances, there's differences between different networks that need to be taken into account, but for the most part, you're dealing with a lot of battles, right, with essentially product-based, uh, traditional product-based companies and relatively recent or transformed platform-based companies. Uh, the kinds of use cases that, 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 that we can look at, you know, sort of as a, we're talking about sort of across uh, all kinds of, you know, retail intelligence, uh, IT automation, supply chain management, market intelligence, et cetera. So the range of application of these technology and business models cuts across many industries. So we're going from, uh, an incredible vertical specific expertise driven competition to one that's much more of a universal set of capabilities that can go out there. And, and venture capitalists in Silicon Valley uh, have the strategy explicitly where they go out there and say, let's build a team, a very strong AI machine learning focused team, and let's figure out which industrial niches we're going to go after next. Uh, one of my favorite examples, a friend of mine who's uh, doing a startup. Uh, Changing the dentistry industry, right? Because you can figure out through AI a better way to detect cavities that you can see on traditional um, sort of, you know, dentists, when they look at an x-ray, they miss a lot of stuff, and AI can improve that, right? So uh, just the, the, the range of applications that I never would have thought of uh, uh, before. Uh, fourth one is nonlinearity. Uh, this is the actual sort of Facebook value curve. Uh, over time, as a, a DA used uh, DAOs are the daily active users. Right? As their user base goes up, you can see the value increase in a linear fashion. Uh, this is you know, Apple versus Nokia. Uh, incremental market cap is a function of people, and so you can see there that this value creation engine works very differently right, than in a product business. So this nonlinearity can, it really changes. It gives you kind of this winner take all mentality that says either we're going to take over space or else we're really nowhere. Right? So Airbnb is either like dominant or it doesn't work, <laughs> right? or it's like nothing. It's like this all or nothing attitude which is changing a lot of things, also driving a wedge in, in uh, a more philosophical wedge. Um, fifth one, I've got only a couple more to go. Uh, 
sort of a restructuring and re-architecture of our economy that we've been talking about. Uh, this is a picture of the internet, and those are the hubs uh, coming out. Uh, that's the structure of our economy today. It's not a bunch of individual uh, isolated industries. Uh, Ten most valuable companies, we all know, lots of tech there. Uh, and then a change in her the Herfindahl Index, which is like the way we measure industry concentration across all sectors. Out of all sectors, uh, the bulk of them uh, are getting more concentrated. Right? So a big economic shift, which essentially it's sort of, you know, in a, in a general fashion, it's sort of a, a implication of this kind of phenomenon. Sort of as these capabilities, as scale becomes more of an issue, as scope becomes more of an issue, it's harder to compete if you're small. And so the larger uh, players are gathering over time more and more market share. Huge problem for antitrust and all kinds of different things. Also a huge problem for antitrust because this is not the way antitrust law is constructed. Uh, right? We, it's all about individual industries. Sixth problem, inequality, right? Uh, this is a job picture uh, over time. Uh, big gap opening up, famous digital divide between knowledge workers uh, and everybody else. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see how the routine uh, work is going away. That's where the unemployment is, is, uh, is the highest, right? And we can see while on average we're all doing great, the dispersion among income among people is increasing, right? Which is a big challenge. So if you go out there, the overall unemployment rate doesn't tell the story, right? It's truly really understanding underemployment. You can also see the, the uh, non-routine uh, manual workers and part-time employment is sort of going up, right? So you see a lot of different people that are coming out of manufacturing and bank teller jobs and things like that, uh, all of driving Ubers, right? Which is not exactly as good uh, a, you know, sort of a career or a job, and it's got all sorts of challenges. Inequality also happening at the firm level. Uh, some great data from John Marina at MIT, who like, shows that over time, labor productivity and overall uh, firm profitability indices between frontier firms and laggard firms in individual industries is opening up, right? So the people that are investing are getting better. People that are investing not so much are staying behind, and the gap is increasing, right, across firms. And so you can kind of see, and you can see it in your life every day. Like you go and walk into a business, yeah, they're kind of, they get this, they're out there doing this, and the spread across different people that we work with is increasing. Uh, which is, again, it, you know, at the local level, it's fine. You know, you can use this as an incentive to improve, but at a macroeconomic level, it's a big problem. Uh, uh, because it leads to this, right? So when the more spread you have, the more challenges you've got, uh, economic disparity and dislocation on top of sort of the kind of all the amazing things that we can do with networks these days in terms of changing the uh, perceptions, people, internet eco chambers, uh, uh, cyber attacks, uh, although you know, more than cyber attacks, almost like cyber influence, right? You go out there and sort of change, shape, reshape uh, public opinion in different ways can lead to all kinds of uh, difficult things uh, uh, which, you know, obviously are becoming quite entrenched. Final one uh, is opportunity. Uh, this is where we come in, right? Uh, we got to fix this, right? Uh, we got to work on this uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. First of all, I mean, help your companies, right? Uh, your companies and your leaders need to understand this is a big deal. Uh, this is not a, 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 an optional piece. Uh, you know, if you're uh, Marriott or if you are, uh, you know, Verizon or whatever it is, this is someplace you just have to absolutely make your number one priority at the, at the CEO level. Uh, driving operating model transformation, this is like the, the real operating side of technological improvement. We have lots of data that shows that it just works. It's just better. Right now, there's like anyone that says, well, it's not worth uh, investing in technology because it's like, eh. BS, because we have data across almost every industrial sector that shows those that actually deploy more technology, enable more business processes with it, differentiate from an operating perspective. Business model innovation is improving, right? Even for traditional players, there's lots more things you can plug your customers into. That's a wonderful thing, right? So the networks work for you as well as for Google. Uh, and for, uh, you know, work for the enterprise, work for the startup, uh, different kind of thing. Uh, you know, multi-platform economies are a really good thing. Uh, the best check on Google is Amazon, right? 
Uh, and uh, that's something that's, uh, that's important. It's a good feature of our economy. We'd only have one. And uh, the last one is sort of kind of get involved a little bit. Um, and I think it's an interesting time to really do this. And it's why it's, it's a special time to really talk to a bunch of leadership transformation uh, people. Um, one of the questions, you know, is fundamentally, can our new leaders measure up? Uh, you know, so like you broke it, you fix it, right? Uh, a little bit. Uh, but um, I wrote a book um, about 15 years ago called The Keystone Advantage that talks about strategy from an ecosystem sustainability perspective. And so if we were to actually think about a strategy that sustains itself, like if you are Apple right now and you're worth a trillion dollars, all right, you have a responsibility that uh, to go out there and work with your own ecosystem of partners, users, and essentially make them sustain themselves because you depend on that uh, to go on and go forward. And we all depend on the same ecosystem ultimately. Uh, and uh, it's not an altruistic thing, it's just it's a good strategy. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, just uh, earlier today in Europe, actually, that's, the date is wrong, it's actually today. Uh, Tim Cook gave an amazing speech actually in, uh, in Europe really talking about this. Uh, this is to a privacy event, so it's all about privacy and Apple has a good strategy on this, but you know, it's like the crisis is real, it's not imagined, exaggerated or crazy, and those of us who believe in technology's potential for good must not shrink from this moment. And so you know, ultimately, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a time, it's a time for activism. It's a time to go out there and shape it and influence it and uh, you know, transform <laughs> your business uh, and help others transform theirs. And as part of doing this, sort of let's kind of build an economy that works a little bit better than, than it's working right now. Uh, with that, I'm all done. And uh, I'd love a couple of questions. I don't know if I can, I know we're at, at five past 10, but uh, can I take a couple of questions? Okay, great, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, please. Thank you. It's um, really interesting. Very, uh, very thorough, very accurate way of being able to help leaders understand how to move to, uh, from, from, uh, from why to how, mm -hmm. or maybe even what. Mm -hmm. um, your example of Nokia. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a great question. And um, Nokia is a, let me start with, with that. Um, uh, I worked with them a little bit in the early 2000s and uh, they knew this was coming. This is the most fascinating thing about Nokia. They actually, they, they played it out. We played it out together. Uh, you know, do a little scenario planning. You know, what can a computer company do to come and eat your lunch? This is it. You know, it's the, the Apple playbook uh, is something that, you know, it's like the way the PC industry worked and I think everybody expected it to come to the smartphone industry. The issue is when to act, how to act. And the more you think about it, the more you realize actually it's a substantial change. Um, it's a substantial change because product companies are built very differently from, product, from platform companies. And this is where we all have to really understand a little bit how, the, how, much, how different the operating model really is. It's all back to the fact that with Nokia, right, a great product company, it's all about focus, right? It's about, ha about having a narrow uh, focus on individual products, having a dedicated teams, dedicated organizations, business units you know, that are aimed at doing one thing, essentially doing it well, as a way to, s to solve all the complexity and optimize and differentiate all the good stuff. Right? And so in doing so, if you look at Nokia, they had you know, 20 different business units. And when the business unit had all these different teams, and each team had engineers focusing on hardware and software together. Right? In doing so, they had the maximum flexibility and they were highly innovative. And they were saying, I don't want to do the same software feature that you know, the other team is doing because I'm optimizing everything for my own customer. Essentially, they were doing everything that we had prescribed they should be doing. Right? 
you know, most of the books in my office tell people to do that, right? Heavyweight teams, all that kind of great stuff. Dedicated, tiger teams, all the buzzwords. Apple is one phone, one platform, right? Because that's how you build an ecosystem. Because if you all different people to connect to this, right, you want to have as much sort of scale as you can out of the individual sort of technology platform. That organizationally is a fundamentally different thing. I mean, imagine if, you know, if there were like 20 different versions of Facebook with different separate networks, right? And every time, it's like it wouldn't work, right? So the challenge is a huge organizational challenge uh, in going from a company that is a whole bu a bunch of autonomous teams to one consistent uh, set of models around how you're going to use technology, how you're going to use data, right? There's an interface, and then you have a bunch of teams that work on top of that. But there's got to be a common foundation. And that is what we need to teach sort of our um, business leaders to build. And it's actually, as it turns out, from a technology perspective, it's actually pretty straightforward. Right? Technology right now, it's like everything is in the cloud. There's a lot of stuff out there in the open domain. It's not that hard to build uh, these kinds of platforms. A, a data platform? Building it from scratch, I mean, Airbnb didn't, didn't spend much money on it, right? And they have about as good data platform as it gets these days. Uh, and financial, you know, they spent billions of dollars but at this point in time, but that's not what it takes to kind of get the original foundation. Right? Organizationally, it's a nightmare, <laughs> right? Because everybody's affiliations, incentives, uh, capabilities, this universal capabilities thing, you know? You go and talk to someone who is in the medium industry, you know, and, is a, and all of a sudden you see YouTube coming at you, and it's like, wow, that's a very different kind of model, right? How do you think about that? And so the cultural aspect of this is a huge deal. So this is why this is really the right group to go out there and, 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 and make that change happen. Right? That's the bottleneck, rethinking the way the IT organization works, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's two things. I mean, I think first, I mean, there, there's two, two sides to the, there's, there are internal responsibilities and then there are external responsibilities, right? Uh, internal responsibilities actually, you know, change your company, transform your company is part of the solution, right? We need to have more creative leaders that are willing to go out there and uh, in some ways against the grain of their existing organizations and rethink that the way their organizations actually need to work. Uh, and, you know, if the, the, you know, the Marriott's and, and uh, say, Verizon's of the world, just to pick examples a little bit at random, uh, you know, are out there and they're structured in a way to support a very different style of business. And so and leaders need to build clarity in what the future looks like and articulate a strategy that's pretty clear in terms of a path of getting there, right? It might take five years, it might take 10 years to do a full transition, but unless they articulate the strategy and, and get going on that, it's never going to happen. There are issues around technology and architecture and decisions they need to make there. There are issues around incubation uh, of an organization that can actually do this. Uh, there are issues around governance and portfolio management and things like that. So there's a bunch of pieces to this, but there is an internal focus uh, that um, that I think leaders of traditional companies really need to embrace. And then uh, internal focus. And then there's an external focus, which is this, right? I mean, ultimately, it's like they have an incredible uh, influence on the way things work, and by sort of either fixing their own companies or if they're you know, leading Facebook or uh, uh, Apple or Amazon or whatever, they have an impact on everybody else. And so from that perspective, realizing this, internalizing this uh, is it a huge deal. I, I spent a lot of time with technology companies over the last 20 years. And I remember like on the previous uh, implosion uh, that we had around 2000, um, 2001, uh, the internet bubble, I remember a little sitting with you know, sort of the CEOs of Yahoo and eBay and people like that. And they really had no idea of the impact they really had on the macro environment around them, right? So it's like their startup mentality, you know, great company, grew fast. All of a sudden, you know, Yahoo can take down a whole economy because of the way the structure deals with the startups. And they didn't quite see that. They saw the individual 
management uh, possibilities, but the collective, uh, the collective impact is something that escaped them. I think the leaders right now have a much better idea, generally speaking, although it's, I, you know, the, the Facebook stories are quite interesting, and there's sort of a little bit of bimodal challenge there. On the one hand, they have, uh, uh, I think they've done an amazing, uh, put an amazing amount of work into this in the last, in the last year to really sort of drive a whole kind of change in how they deal with various things. Uh, on the other hand, obviously, they were caught by surprise uh, down in the 2014, 2015, 2016 timeframe. You know, part of it, part of what's sometimes hard to understand is that these companies are growing at a rate that is so incredibly fast, and just individually, it's hard to kind of cope with that, with that kind of thing, and all of a sudden realize, I mean, if you're a little kid and you're 30 years old, and all of a sudden, you know, like your own policies are going to take the world down <laughs> if you're not careful, right? Because there's so much impact. I mean, that curve, surprise, it's real and surprises everybody, uh, especially the people that are on it. Uh, and so, you know, make sure that your leaders get this uh, and that, you know, they can do a bunch of things. Uh, yeah, sure. Last question. Okay. All right. Um, so this is all about connecting. Yeah. Yes. And they've been taken advantage of. My favorite industry. Yes. Yes. How do you see the future of telcos to transform that? Yes. Well, uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, if you, uh, I think in, in 94 or 93, AT&T, uh, AT&T Bell Labs back in those days did this video Right, of all the future technologies that were going to come out. In fact, if you actually, it's a, it's a priceless video, you can get it on YouTube, and it has essentially everything that we do today. You know, everything from uh, sort of the smartphones to the video everything, et cetera, et cetera. It's really kind of a neat thing. And so uh, the big question is why wasn't it them that did it? And then secondly, you know, why, you know, what are they doing now? Uh, in terms of why it wasn't them, I mean, we can talk about all the individual stories about sort of the, we kind of the Nokia moments and so on. So I mean, you know, very, telecom is structured very much in a different fashion, as you know well. I mean, it's like 99, 99999999 percent reliability kind of mentality, which is really different from the kinds of crazy experiments that you would do if you're a Facebook or a, or a Snapchat. Um, right now, uh, what they're uh, what they're doing is a, you know, it's 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 a, it's one of those moments where you've got 5G coming at you. Uh, the rationalization for 5, 5G cannot be rationalized as just another technological improvement to increase the bandwidth speed, which all the previous generations in telco have been rationalized on. So being a sort of dumb pipe, if you like, from the telco perspective is not going to uh, work anymore. You see telecommunications, especially the smaller ones, smaller organizations, where the core business is eroding at a rate of you know, 5, 10, 15 percent every year. And so it's kind of a desperate strait. So, I mean, the reality is, I think we're going to have some players that are investing now, and some of them are pre doing pretty interesting things, like Comcast, which is sort of a telco, sort of, right? Cable company, whatever. It's done some interesting things at the platform level. Uh, AT&T has done some interesting things. Um, and they're all working at it, right? Uh, the, the smaller organizations uh, are going to have a hell of a hard time, uh, I think, and uh, unless they're incredibly innovative, uh, but I don't see right now as a lot of hope right there. So I think you're going to see consolidation, uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, increased concentration among some of the more innovative players. Uh, banks are looking similarly right now, uh, but in my view. But anyway, thank you so much. This is great. <laughs> thank you.